they talk, for example, about the, um, on page 723, except for the darker brown colour, livers appeared normal at necropsy. I mean, you, you, you can't do that without looking inside. You, you, you have to look at the content in, in, inside the liver, taking sections, showing under the microscope that there is no, no difference. They've used, for example, older, older rats. Obviously, again, if you want to avoid any problems, OK, use an adult. But uh, if you want to, to see if, if uh, any changes are evident, then you should use younger individuals, of course. In some ways, you could say it's bad science because um, a lot of the data that they should have shown isn't shown. But did you try, for instance, to get access to the raw data? I didn't. A colleague of mine did and spent quite a frustrating length of time going through different uh, offices and, 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 and so on. But finally, the answer, was, uh, the, the, the answer was no. If there was nothing to hide, then there should be no, no problem. You be, should be willing to, to distribute your, your material for anybody to, to work on. And when, it's, when, when you keep it, keep it tight, then you suspect that there's why, why is this the case? One thing is sure. Thanks to this limited study, Monsanto's GMOs have inundated the world, principally in North and South America, Asia and Australia. After only 10 years, transgenic crops now cover 250 million acres. 70% are Roundup resistant. And 30% have been genetically modified to produce an insecticide called BT. Since 2001, the company has published a yearly document titled The Pledge Report. A kind of ethics statement in which Monsanto tries to justify its business practices. At the heart of the opposition to GMOs is the subject of patents. This is what Monsanto calls their intellectual property, which are supposed to protect their investment. In North America, every farmer who buys bioengineered seeds must sign a technology agreement in which the farmer promises to respect the company's patent on the modified gene. Biotech crops are protected by U.S. patent law. And so I may not in any way save seed to uh, replant uh, the following year. It's uh, something that uh, is a protection for, the, for Monsanto, for biotech companies, because they literally invest millions and millions of dollars uh, to produce this new technology. And how can Monsanto know that someone, for instance, replant harvested seeds? I, I'm not sure how, they, how to answer that, no. How they, would, how they would know if someone replanted seed. That's a good question for Monsanto. <laughs> the question is so touchy that Monsanto prefers to circumvent it by making glorious promises. In cases of unintended appearance of our proprietary varieties on a farmer's field, we will surely work to resolve the matter to the satisfaction of both the farmer and Monsanto. The reality seems much less idyllic. The Center for Food Safety in Washington, D.C. published a study on farmers sued by Monsanto for having not respected its seed patents. It found at least a hundred lawsuits and many bankruptcies. Among the victims, Troy Rush, an Indiana farmer. Our story starts back in 1999. A gentleman, and I use that term loosely, uh, showed up at my mother and father's farm, and uh, he claimed to be uh, a private investigator hired by Monsanto. And uh, he was uh, out investigating uh, farmers saving their own seed, uh, and uh, asked us, uh, he'd come right out and ask us if we'd saved their seed. And uh, 
we told him no we had not and um, offered up our herbicide purchases and seed purchases uh, all the receipts and everything um, told him where everything was purchased so he could go check it out for himself um, he uh, he declined that uh, that offer and um, what occurred is then they they sued us Monsanto filed a lawsuit against myself uh, my father and my two brothers and uh, Monsanto presented us with uh, documents that they claimed were uh, samples taken from our farms to obtain those samples Monsanto had to have trespassed upon our land without our permission and stole those samples that year I recall we had uh, 492 acres of Roundup Ready soybeans um, and they were they were growing under contract for a company for seed um, and the contract was very specific it spelled out the specific fields so it wasn't a problem in isolating those fields um, everybody knew it and why did you settle out of court with, with Monsanto well after two and a half years of this uh, the family was just just destroyed um, uh, the stress involved in this I mean they're in essence threatening five generations of work and um, if they would to prevail in something like this it's all gone they take it all away they take it all away good morning good morning sir how are you this morning Troy I'm well how are you David still surviving good <laughs> Troy Roush and David Runyon grow conventional soybeans. They have been victims of the so-called gene police. Created by Monsanto to enforce its law in the fields, the gene police so fear in rural America, where farmers denounce the totalitarian methods used in a GMO-dominated world. I have some pictures here for you, Troy, I'd like for you to look at. Okay. Here's what I have done, Troy, to uh, help prevent re-entry on my farm. Of anyone coming onto my farm. <laughs> Summer, it was in July of 2003, and they came, it was the latter part of July, they came to my house, it was uh, like 7 p.m. Who came? Uh, Monsanto employees. And they presented me with a uh, business card. And uh, they asked me a few questions about the kind of soybeans I plant, the kind of corn I plant, uh, where I market my crops, and so I said, okay, that's the end of the conversation. Yeah, patents have changed. They've changed everything. It revolves with a, with, with a relationship of trust with neighbors. That is gone. Uh, my, myself, I probably only have two farmers that I talk to that are close to me. Are they really afraid, the farmers? Of course they're afraid. You can't defend yourself against these people. They've created a little industry that, that serves no other purpose than to wreck farmers' lives. Um, of course they're afraid. Does that mean that you're afraid, for instance, that the neighbor can snitch on you? Yes. Yes? Yeah. Yes. All you have to do is, is dial 1-800. Dial 1-800-MONSANTO. Or no, I'm sorry, 1-800-ROUNDUP. I remember encouraging farmers to uh, call this, this toll-free number and turn their neighbor in. And why does Monsanto do that? Well, the reason they do it is control. Seeds? Yeah. They want to control the seed. They want to own life. I mean, this is the building blocks of food we're talking about. They, they are in the process of owning food, all food. Between 1995 and 2005, Monsanto acquired over 50 seed companies throughout the world. These companies produce corn, cotton, wheat, and soybean, and also seeds for tomatoes, potatoes, and sorghum. Everywhere, people worry about Monsanto's monopoly, which in the long term threatens to wipe out all non-transgenic varieties. Monsanto doesn't agree and speaks only about the benefits of biotechnology, especially in developing countries like India. Our products provide significant economic benefits to both large and small growers. In many cases, farmers are able to grow higher quality and better yielding crops. India is the world's third largest cotton producer. In 1999, Monsanto acquired Mahiko, the country's leading seed company. Two years later, the Indian government authorized the sale of BT cotton under the brand name Balgard.
It is genetically modified to produce an insecticide which repels ballworms, a cotton parasite. <laughs> Since 2001, Kiran Sakari and Abdul Gayam have been closely following the transgenic cotton grown by small farmers in the Warangal district. Every year, the two agronomists publish a report comparing bioengineered cotton with conventional cotton in terms of yields and production costs. In 2006, the harvest was ravaged by a disease that affects transgenic cotton.